Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Scott from TechSIQ. Um, welcome to our third panel on the webinar series, The Inevitable. Today we're focusing specifically on privilege and privilege review and how AI is reshaping privilege review. Let's just jump right in. Uh, on the topic of privilege review. So we have a very broad audience today. Um, really excited, uh, over 170 folks are registered for this event, um, but have very broad ranging backgrounds. So I think before we get into the AI advancement side, let's first start with, with some fundamentals. So um, under the federal rules of civil procedure, privileged data, privileged matters are excluded from the scope of discovery. Privilege matters are information protected by attorney client privilege and work product. Um, so, you know, let's, let's start there and, and Bobby, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Um, obviously it's more complicated than that. So let's start by defining this challenge. What is privilege and what's the status quo for privilege review? So privilege review is really when you're making the final determination on a privilege, whether a document is privileged. Um, usually you have your first pass review um, and then a specialized second pass review uh, where you're looking at documents that are potentially privileged and kind of making a final call. Um, it's a very slow and tedious process as you're making final privilege determinations. Uh, you're creating very, to the extent the documents are deemed as privileged, uh, you're drafting log lines, which is a very kind of time consuming and tedious process. Um, historically, much of the kind of the privilege workflow couldn't be automated. Um, it's also a very difficult process to, to manage. You have multiple levels of potential review going on at privilege. You couldn't be having a special team who's making the final determination on privilege. Another, yet another team who's actually creating the log lines. Yet another team who's uh, responsible for redactions. There might be special privilege issues that are applicable to your clients, your clients' data. So you might have a special team for that. Um, and then, you know, the fact is you're dealing with the, your, your clients' most sensitive documents usually. So there's heightened QC checks for consistency and accuracy to really mitigate the risk or try to mitigate the risk of inadvertent disclosures and messy clawback situations. So very difficult, you know, in terms of being tedious and a workflow perspective. And then you get into the substance, right? Uh, just so many gray areas. Um, if you have an attorney who's wearing multiple hats, let's say, legal hat and a business hat, try to parse out what's legal advice that could be privileged and what's business advice that's not privileged. It's a very difficult kind of gray area to deal with. Um, common interest doctrine, right? Trying to decipher whether there is a common interest. Uh, third party agents, are there agents that don't waive or break privilege? Um, and then finally, in terms of privilege, the laws kind of vary potentially by jurisdiction. So for example, what's a work product in one jurisdiction may not be covered by work product in another jurisdiction. So it's a very dynamic and fluid process, um, unlike other parts of kind of e-discovery. So there's a lot of room for kind of interpretation and you know, two reasonable, intelligent lawyers can look at the same document and basically come up with opposite conclusions on whether a document is privileged. So that's kind of the, that kind of sets the stage in terms of what it is and why it's difficult. As Bobby indicated, you know, probably the biggest problem is the role of in-house counsel. Um, and too many corporate employees think, okay, if I add an attorney to the CC line after the 25 business people who really need to see this memo, and then I also invite that attorney to a meeting on when, you know, setting prices for next year, of course, we'll be totally protected by the privilege. And the difference between an attorney in-house in particular giving legal advice versus business advice is extraordinarily difficult to parse through. Privilege review in litigation would be much easier if, you know, in every corporation, in-house counsel very clearly delimited, you know, this email is giving you my legal advice about the issue of X you asked me about. And then a separate email, in terms of raising prices, 
Uh, my business advice is this would be the wrong time after COVID to, to do that or things like that. But that's pretty unrealistic. Um, and the final factor and the thing that is probably the most easy for all the reviewing attorneys, no matter how good they are, uh, to miss is the email from business person A to business person B saying, Laura advised us to do such and such. And the reviewing attorneys don't make the connection that it was Laura Kibbe as the in-house counsel at her company. You know, or worse, they refer to some lawyer by their nickname. LK advised us or, you know, whatever. That is extremely difficult in the normal workflow to figure out and to deal with. Yeah, ab absolutely, Laura. I, I saw you nodding your head, and I know uh, you know. Is there anything else that you'd like to add in terms of, given this nuance, you know, what is the status quo? How is this like? How are you finding these documents given all this nuance now, and what makes that so difficult and expensive? Well, I think that, right, the whole point is there has to be a better way, right? So Bobby mentioned before, first pass, second pass. I would be lying if I said I had not experienced in my professional career like eight pass review um, by the time everything got done. And that is the challenge, right? You can put, so you not only delay the fact development in your case because you're going through all these process hurdles trying to figure out what's privileged and what's not. Um, as Judge Peck said, even the best reviewer is going to get it wrong at least part of the time. Um, and then on the other side of the court, once you've done these, uh, done the privilege log and you've produced the privilege log, then you're going to spend however many months, weeks, um, years maybe fighting over privilege and having to go back and recomb over it again because the other side has challenged your assertion of privilege. So I like to say that my challenge is to get it to a one pass review. If I'm going to devote eyeballs to a document, I want to get as much out of those eyeballs on that one pass as possible. And you do that by empowering the reviewer or trainer, however you're looking at it with technology. I do want to shift a little bit to sort of the future. Um, and we've had, you know, quite a few questions come in ahead of this, this panel, as well as some live during um, around centering around sort of innovation and, and technology and specifically Bobby, what you described as the advantage of AI to sort of make these con contextual distinctions, understand relationships. W what are the applications that you're hoping for or seeing beyond privilege? What could the future look like when you're considering technology like that? And I, I pose this question to, to all of you, Laura, I know you have a, a thought on this as well, so we can maybe start with you. Sure. Um, so getting back to my one pass review, right? My utopia is I want to take all of my documents, I want to throw them in the hopper, and I want different buckets to come out. I want a responsive bucket to come out. I want a responsive but not but privileged bucket to come out. I want to, here's all your other special treatments, i.e. personal information that needs to be redacted, uh, you know, P I PII, PHI kind of thing, so that you're tackling the collection as a collection, and you're learning how everything relates so you're not treating everything separately you're putting it all into the hopper together and getting different outputs now the needs and the output needs are going to change so making sure that the technology is you know anticipating for example maybe privacy certain certain beyond pii phi kind of things that come out um that you can detect using ai to feed it five questions and get five answers how far are we from now, Laura? I mean, I, we're close. We're close. I mean, I did it. I, I did it in a case with um, well over a million documents and never used a single contract attorney. Great. Anything else anyone wants to add to that, that question about sort of what the future might hold in applications of AI? You know, another way to think about that, it's like allowing, you know, lawyers to do what lawyers do best, which is to, to make those judgment calls through the legal research and not with their, you know, what they're, you know, frankly, sort of overpriced to do, which is to sort of mechanically do the same thing over, over and over again. That's that's what technology is good at, and so there's a there's a natural symbiosis there. 
Well, I think that's what's been missing in the market too, right? We've had tools that, oh, they can do this and they can do that and they can do that. But from a, an efficiency standpoint, we want to use, we want it to do it all at the same time. And it would be great if particularly for corporations, if the classification of a document as privileged stays with the document uh, for future litigation. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think most vendors now and law firms, when the case is over, you get your original documents back, they destroy the working <laughs> set, or at least they're supposed to, but it's not clear to me that uh, that sort of coding, which is likely to be the same in every case, maybe not work product, but certainly attorney client, um, why reinvent the wheel and have to code the document for the third time because it's in the third litigation? Yeah, th th I think that's such an important point. That's what I really see happening in the future, kind of large scale adoption of these AI models and really corporate clients really running these privileged AI models behind the firewall. So basically spitting out work product and rankings related to privilege at the point of processing. So it's passed downstream. So you're not reinventing the wheel in every case. You have almost a priv bank or priv model built in house where you can utilize the same work product over and over again. I really do think that is the way of the future. And, you know, and, and honestly, we're, we're working with a few clients to kind of develop a, a similar um, approach. Well, and I think that both uh, Microsoft 365 and the Google suite are making it even easier. If you have the benefit of this work product or call, we can now easily get it back in to those tenants and store it with that with that document for the rest of its life that, it, that it's going to live in there. Um, and I, as somebody who originally did not like the concept of putting it all in the cloud, um, seeing technology advancements like this and how easy it actually is going to make our lives going forward, it's, you know, again, I'll use the word again, game changer. Um, but thank you all so much. Um, really appreciated the time today and uh, have a good rest of your day.